Here we go with the latest episode five of Where My Killer Tape at. Y'all know where we at. Um, we're going to talk about, we're not going to talk about Wakanda. Well, we are going to talk about Wakanda. We're just not going to talk about Black Panther, the movie, which you should go see. We will talk about Eric Killmonger. Um, also bring up why I hate stutter stop rap battles and um, Illuminati videos on YouTube. And I'm talking touch again about, you know, Monique. And we're going to bring you the same stuff. Also, shout out to Blade in there. Um, but we're also going to talk about health and how to approach women. Check it out. Hey, yo, yo, I like, I like how that Sister Nancy dub, how that, how that bass line, how it starts. Yo, how does it go? How does it go? Yo, for this one, I'm sipping this sangria um, that Trader, Trader Holes has. Trader Holes has it. Maria Hola, spelled J-O-L-A. Um, and it's a, a white sangria or blanche sangria. White sangria. Um, and it's produced in France. And it comes in like this plastic bottle. Like you could probably walk over and won't even notice it. But this sangria is very good. It's, it's very sweet, though. So they use a lot of sugar. Um, it, it feels like, it tastes like it uses a lot of sugar. It doesn't tell you how many grams is in it. But it's really good. Um, I love it, man. Just you just want to sit and chill in your house. I highly recommend it. And that's what I'm sipping on for this podcast. Word. Yo, the other day I was hanging out with some young boys and they were talking to me about remember remember the Heelys? Remember those little those little wheels? That were, under, that were under your sneakers and you could like roll around in them. Anyway, they were telling me that their school banned Heelys. And I was just like, wow, you know, like where I'm from, uh, you know, let me stop doing that where I'm from stuff. Anyway, so he's, they were telling me that their school banned Heelys. And I was like, yo, that's crazy. That's blowing my mind right now. And I never forget the first time I saw Heelys. I remember, I, I know I was in a mall somewhere and I'm not a mall person. So I should know which mall I was in because I don't really go to malls like that. And anyway, I saw this little boy, he's probably about 10, and he just like, skirt, you know, he just like, skirt, right around the corner, man, and I was just like, yo, he like, he like, he like lifted his, his uh, toes up, and he, he just like slid right around the corner, it was like really dope, it was just like, yo, blew my mind, yo, I was bugging, so then I ran into him again, I said, yo, man, how you do that, and that little dude was like, yo, it's magic, and yo, I'm not even going front. I kind of sort of believed them because I didn't know where Heelys were. You know what I'm saying? Like, at the time, my oldest, he was like a teenager, so he didn't really get down with that. He was like later teens. And then, like, you know, my younger kids, they were younger. They were mad young, so they weren't, weren't they wasn't really rocking that or asking for it. So I saw my man do that, and I, I really thought he was a magician, man. I said, yo, can you show me how to do that? He said, I'll show you one day, you know? And then, like, the, a couple of days later, I seen another kid do it. And I was like, yo, I stopped and like, yo, man, because two people can't have the same magic trick. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, unless you're a magician. So I was like, yo, my man, how you do that? And he showed me the wheels and I was like, wow, like, that's crazy. So that's a dope invention that I wish they had when I was a kid. Oh, well. Yo, cats is funny. You be debating people, you know, and and then they always want to bring up the Illuminati. Woo, Illuminati, right? And it's crazy because people will send me these videos, and I know like my man, one of my coworkers, he's all about the Illuminati. So he'd be like, "You gotta watch this video, son." So he'll send me a YouTube link, and I'll check it out. You know what I'm saying? I want to see what they're talking about. And it's like the video could be like 25 minutes long, but the first six to seven minutes is just scary music and then just like illuminati you know like they're all over the place they're here they're there and it, it, they go they do the like six seven minutes of just just how bad the illuminati is how scary it is but they don't actually give you like no nothing based in history nothing factual they don't really get into the meat of the stuff until like eight to nine minutes in and it 
it, it kind of like makes me fall asleep. So it's just funny watching these because they all have the same and they, all of them are the same way. Even if they're six minutes long, the first three minutes is just scary music with quotes from different people from around history talking about things, but nothing really substantial. So I always got to laugh at those, those Illuminati videos or Yo, I know I'm beating a dead horse with this, but we got to talk about Monique again. And, and it's one of those things where, like, you know, a black woman has said it over and over again and we just continue to ignore her. And I think it's fucked up, like, for real. Like, you know, and um, what she ended up doing was she ended up releasing the details of some of the, 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 the parts of the contract that Netflix wanted to hit her up with. And, and, and you really see how, like, they were really trying to do her dirty. And look. I'm not going to sit here and discuss the details of the contract. I just want to say two things. Number one, people are like, yo, she's being messy because she's putting people's names out there. The reason why she's doing that is because nobody believes her. You feel me? Like, it's one of those things like you don't want to like snitch on people. You don't want to put them out there. You don't want to put their business out there. But people are coming at you like you crazy. So you got to do it. You know what I mean? Because those people, you know, once you say their names, now you can ask them, yo, is this true? And come to find out she is true, right? She, she is right. She is telling the truth. The second thing is, we love victim blaming, man. I mean, yo, especially when it comes to women, especially black women. We love victim blaming. We love it. It's like, if there was an Olympic sport for victim blaming, we will always get the gold medal. Like, the United States will always get the gold medal in victim blaming if there was an Olympic sport. But in this entire thing, in this whole thing, Netflix is the offender. Netflix is the one that's like, you know, as much as I love Netflix, right? They're the ones that are violating. They're the ones that are trying to jerk Monique. And this entire time, yo, we've been blaming her, like calling her out on that. Like, oh, you bugging, you tripping, you tripping. Hey, yo, man, if somebody do you dirty like that, what do you think you're going to do, man? Some of us might even get physically violent, you know? So we need to really chill on that victim blaming stuff. But the violator, really, for real, for real, the people, the, per the people we should be mad at, that we should be making jokes on, is Netflix. Word. Quite as kept. I used to be a battle MC. I mean. I used to get it in. And I don't know. I know sometimes I get old fogey on this because I come from an era where you just, you know, somebody had to throw on a beat and you went in like, you know, like 16 bars in. Like you didn't just like, you know what, you know what they're doing now with the stutter stop battles. Thank you, Eminem. I blame Eminem for that. Um, the stutter stop battles where like cats will rhyme like three or four lines. The crowd goes crazy and it's just like and they stop and then they go again. And it's kind of like. Um, it's ridiculous, man. It's stupid. I don't think it's a battle. I don't think those stutter stop battles are battles. They should just call it what it is. Two line battles or haku battles. That's what they should call it. Right. Um, because to me, I feel like if you a battle MC, I should be able to throw on a beat and I'm not saying you should be able to rhyme to every beat, but you should be able to freak a beat. You know what I mean? And it's, you know, and again, I come from an era where you, you actually would put on a dope ass instrumental. And the whole crowd would go nuts just hearing the instrumental, and that gave you the energy to go. Now, I work with a lot of young people, and they always say, oh, I heard you can spit. And I'm like, all right, and I, and I, I drop a few, you know what I'm saying? Like, I go in, I'll do a whole 16, you know, um, and then they'll come back with like two or three lines. It just feels like, it, it, man, it reminds me of this one battle I saw with Rozell the Godfather Noise. If you don't know who Rozell the Godfather Noise is, look him up. If not, if he's performing in your town, go see him town. Anyway, go see him perform, right? Anyway, he's a beatboxer. And I remember this cat was beatboxing and at this one club he was at. And he was good. He was just like dope. I mean, he was going in. And then he was like, yo, I want to battle Rozelle, the Godfather Noise. And then Rozelle got up on stage and was like, you know, dude went first. And I was like, damn, dude killed it. But then Rozelle just, he just did like, he just did like a, a, a one, two, three, four. He just said, boom, 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 back. And it was just so loud and just so like, it just like, 
ate the sound system up and you was just like, man, there's no competition in this. And that's how I feel. That's really how I feel. Like, I don't see really any competition. So doesn't mean I'm going to get back in the circuit. But if you want to battle me, let's go. First, if you haven't seen um, the movie Black Panther, you might want to go check it out. Just to, just saying. Uh, I'm going to talk about Wesley Snipes and Blade. And, and when I say Blade, I mean the first two movies, one and two. I don't know what the hell they were doing with Blade 3. Anyway, um, shout out to Blade. And let me just say this. Before Blade came out, Hollywood never took comic book heroes um, seriously, right? You had the Batman movies, you know, the Tim Burton Batman movies, but people didn't really take those seriously, right? They were seen more as like, not a parody, but they just weren't taken seriously. So when he did Blade, um, you know, he made a lot of, he made, he didn't make, it wasn't a blockbuster, but he made a lot of money for those two movies. Matter of fact, I think he ate well for those first two movies that he produced and he directed the first one. Guillermo del Toro directed the second one. But he produced it, you know, got people to do choreography. He put a lot of people on. Um, I think that th those two movies are very important um, when it comes to comic book hero movies. Number one, it actually helped save Marvel. It really pulled Marvel out of it, you know. And you can, Stan Lee actually says that in his book. Um, Blade and Wesley Snipes really pulled Marvel out of the dump because they were going through some times. On top of that, it set a standard. And really, you would not have the Marvel Cinematic Universe if it wasn't for the Blade movies, right? And just in the number three, I just want to point out that Wesley Snipes originally wanted to do the Black Panther movie. But Marvel was actually, we learn now that Marvel was actually trying to make, sell those rights, Black Panther along with Thor. We just learned that, and, I, and I'll put it in the show notes. They were going to try to sell that to Sony after they sold Spider-Man. Um, but Sony was like, we just want Spider-Man. Everybody don't really care about those other characters. But Blade really, 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 oh, you know, excuse me, Blade. Huh? Wesley Snipes really, really wanted to do Black Panther. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, you can go two ways, right? Because we wouldn't have the Marvel Cinematic Universe go the way it did if Marvel sold something to him. Maybe it would have been different. I'm not saying that, that Wesley Snipes didn't have the vision or the resources. It just wasn't the right time for it. Um, especially with the world building that, you know, the Black Panther does with Wakanda. And number two, if Marvel did sell to Sony, we probably wouldn't be talking about Black Panther. So it's kind of ill. But anyway, shout out to Wesley Snipes. Blade 2 is probably my favorite Wesley Snipes movie. Shout out to the Fan Bro Show. Um, and go back and watch Blade 1 and Blade 2, and you're going to see some dope stuff, some dope choreography. Word. Now, the original plan was to do a, a dope um, review of Black Panther, you know what I mean? But I want to do one with spoilers, so I figured I won't do it this week because I don't think everybody's going to be done watching it, even though I don't know why you ain't go see Black Panther this uh, week. But what I wanted to do instead is I wanted to kind of like save it for next week, for the next episode, and I wanted to talk about Killmonger. Um, and we're going to go from there. And so the next piece, the next segment is going to be about Killmonger. So bear with me. Like I said, next week, we're going to talk about Black Panther. And the episode after that, we're going to talk about some of the things that Black Panther covers that a lot of people may not even peep. Uh, and it's because you just don't read the comic book. So check it out, man. First of all, I got to come clean. I never liked Eric Killmonger in the comic book. Um, I never really liked him. Like, and it, it wasn't that he sucked. I just... I, I look at Black Panther as like one of the top, you know, 10 heroes in, 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 Marvel, in the Marvel Universe in the comic book. So I've always felt that like, you know, Manate, you guys know was in Baku. Eric Killmonger, whose name is actually in Jadaka. I kind of felt like they were like second or third tier villains. I don't think they were like up to snuff. With T'Challa, like I think, I think Doctor Doom is like his nemesis that he need to take care of. Like, I don't even like Claw isn't even all that to me, you know what I mean? But like Doctor Doom is someone who's 
to me on equal terms with him and Reed Richards. So anyway, that being said, I was kind of worried. And, and look, I'm going to be the first to say it. Eric Killmonger, Killmonger breaks the curse. He breaks that curse. Everybody, even us hardcore MCU fans, always felt that when it comes to Marvel movies, like the villains are kind of like, yeah, they're either one dimensional or they're not developed enough. So I think we call it the MCU curse. They just can't do it. Loki don't count because Loki, I don't know. He's a trickster god, you know, according to his guardian myth. But I don't feel like he's a villain. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like he's more like he just goes for self, right? Anyway, um, but with Eric Killmonger in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the new Black Panther movie, yo, Ryan Coogler, salute to you. Marvel did it, man. They broke the curse, man. They broke the villain curse. Now, this is where I, my issue with the X-Men stuff is from Fox, right? Here's why, because Magneto was one of my favorite, I won't even call him villains, he's one of my favorite Marvel characters. One of my favorite comic book characters, to be honest. And a lot of it has to do with his background, which the, the X-Men movie universe for Fox, they actually went through it. They actually showed how he became Magneto, and they even went further when they rebooted it, and they put my man Michael Fassbender in it, right? So like, and, and actually like in that in that one movie, he actually goes around killing Nazis, which is something that I, the comic book eventually adapted where he was going around killing people that try to commit genocide against mutants. So that was probably one of my favorite series of Magneto, the comic book series. He was actually doing something that makes perfect sense, right? Reenact, enacting revenge on people that try to kill his people out, right? Because he said when he was during the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, he said, um, I'm never going to let this happen again. Right? I'm never going to let people kill my people ever again. That if I got to go out there and wipe out cities of people, then so be it, right? And I think it's the same thing with um, Killmonger in the movie. Like, you're kind of like, he's not one-dimensional, right? They actually show you everything. The only thing they don't show you is his mom, right? Like, which, which, which um, asks another question. Did he feel abandoned by his mother? Like, what happened to his mother? But anyway, that's a, that's a question for another day. Killmonger does his thing, and... His character is developed very well. And I'm, again, there's not going to be any spoilers in this discussion about him. But I want to talk about a couple of things that Killmonger represents that a lot of people are missing. Okay, now Killmonger um, was raised outside of, or he raised himself outside of Wakanda. And I like how the storyline in the movie really takes a lot from the history of Killmonger. Um, there's some slight variations, and I'm not going to get into it, but it sticks. And that's probably what I like about Black Panther. It really sticks to a lot of the storylines held throughout the different volumes written by different people um, throughout his history in the Marvel comic books. So I think that's probably one of my reasons, the reasons why I love this movie. And a lot of this Marvel Cinematic Universe, they, they stay true to a lot of the uh, writing, which, hint, hint, DC, you should be doing. Anyway, and, and I know I threw shots. But um, one thing about Eric is that he has a different approach to how Wakanda should, should do his foreign policy. Previously, Wakanda had a uh, policy of isolationism. And it makes sense, right? They have vibranium, they have all this technology, they want to kind of protect it. Particularly after, um, you know, Europeans invaded Africa. Like, they really had to keep it on the low. And they wanted to protect the citizens. They didn't want to be in consistent war with European powers and other people and other countries that might, you know, really um, have issues with them. And let's say, and you know, in the comic book, there are provinces around Wakanda that have tried to invade, particularly Niganda. Um, and a whole bunch of other forces that have tried to do it as well because they knew what they had behind those walls. And in the comic book, they, the walls actually kept out refugees. Now, let me just say this. Um, in the comic book, T'Challa is the first monarch to actually go against the idea of isolationism. Uh, we see as he makes allegiances with like the Fantastic Four, he becomes later an Avenger. Um, he travels outside the, and lives outside the United States, uh, outside of Wakanda. He actually marries a non-Wakandan, you know, Storm. So he's one of the first. And don't get me wrong. There are factions within Wakanda amongst his um, royal court and amongst even the Dora Milaje 
who feel like his approach to foreign policy actually weakens Wakanda. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Right? And, and, and you see that play out in a lot of the stories. A lot of people try to overthrow him from within. And it makes, it makes perfect sense. You, 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 know, you come up under certain rulers and things are going a particular way. Uh, under isolationism, you don't have any problems, right? Then here comes this one guy. He's like, you know what? We're going to change that. We're going to really open up our borders. And then they get all these problems, right? So there's always been that strain, uh, you know, that, that thread of, of, you know, what your foreign policy is going to be, which I think is what, what makes Black Panther so dope because as a monarch, he has to make decisions that are good for Wakanda. It may not be good for him, but it's good for Wakanda. And some of those decisions are bad, right? And in the, and in the movie, they talk about that. And I think... Killmonger coming in representing that foreign change to foreign policy that you know you know I think that's dope to introduce that. So that's that's one thing Killmonger does. Another thing Killmonger does is that it, it, he he talks about pan-africanism, right? I know the movie doesn't say it, right? The movie doesn't say it, but what he's thinking about is pan-africanism, right? And if you don't know what Pan-Africanism, Google it, right? And, and look, that threat is also in Black Panther, right? In the comic book, right? He's been checked by Luke Cage and Misty Knight. He's been checked by Sam Wilson. All these different um, black superheroes and other superheroes of color who, who have told them, like, yo, you know, what do you do for African people in the diaspora? Diaspora is spelled D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. If you don't know what that is, please Google that, Right? Um, and that's always been a common thread. There's people in Wakanda that are like, no, we shouldn't do nothing. That's not, that's not our, our fault. That's not our business. They'll figure it out. And then there's some Wakandans who feel like, yeah, it is our duty to help other Africans. Not just, you know, in the Western Hemisphere, but also on the African continent itself. itself. So, and it's a good, it's a very good question, right? And again, um, Killmonger brings that up. And T'Challa, you know, he realizes that Again, as a monarch, he has to make certain decisions that are good for his people, like the Wakandans. That's what he has to look out for, right? That's what he's been pledged to do. And none of none of his the monarchs that are in his lineage, none of the old Black Panthers who have passed away and gone to their ancestors, they've all had the same approach, right? And I'm pretty sure there were people, um, especially during European colonialism, there were Wakandans who felt like, hey, we should do something. We can't just let this happen. Because these are our people, even though they're not, we're not, you know, we don't, we're not have the same lineage of ancestry. They were still, you know, Africans, right? And it, it's funny because a lot of this is something that a lot of African nations discuss, right? You look at how African nations get down, and there's that question: should we be, should we involve ourselves? And that's why you have the African Union, where they're they're deciding like, hey, we need to start involving ourselves in these conflicts that are in our borders instead of expecting Europeans to do it for us or America to do it for us. So, I think. That's a good debate. It's a good question. And Killmonger brings that up. He represents that. And, and, and a lot of it is because his character in the movie, just like his character in the comic book, he did not grow up in Wakanda. He didn't. So he, he doesn't have access to information and technology and that privilege, really privilege, that Wakandans have. So he's seen people. He came up, you know, in the United States. So he's seen people suffer. He's seen all that. He's, and, in the, and in the movie, he's in the hood, right? So I think... That's important to note. And that's probably why I like Killmonger, because they really fleshed out his character. And Marvel, take note, when you do your next villain, you know, like, you know, I'm kind of worried about Thanos, because, I, I mean, I know who Thanos is, but that character is not fleshed out in the MCU. We just get a glimpse of him, and people might mention him here and there, but we don't really know what drives him, right, in the MCU. We know what drives him in the comic book, so we don't want him to be this one-dimensional dude, so... Killmonger set the precedent, you know, he, he set the tone, he set the standards, so shout out to Ryan Coogler again, shout out to Michael B. Jordan, because Killmonger is dope, yo, like, you know, and then, and, and you know, let's talk about something else, right? Now, just his name Killmonger, right, when you think about that, you think about somebody that, yo, he kills and 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 you know you, you, in the comic book he's he's treated as someone who's like really savage like really really ruthless you think the mcu one version is ruthless he's in the comic book he's mad ruthless he don't give a damn right um and he will do anything to achieve his means right but you know what what, what happens when you look at people like him and magneto um and 
you know, they came up in a world that's violent, so they see that violence is the way, is a means of getting what they want. It's particularly liberation, right? And there's always been that discussion, right? Particularly in, the, in, in communities that are marginalized, right? How do, we, how do we fight for social justice? How do we fight for liberation? How do we, how do we get self-determination, right? Um, you know, that's how they got with me Abu Jamal in trouble, right? Because he said, he wrote one time that Mao Zedong said, you know, um, what did he say? He said, uh, he said uh, liberation comes from the battle of a gun. You know, like, that's how you win. That's something to that effect, right? But there are people who believe that that needed to be done, you know, that you needed to fight, you know, you needed to retaliate, that you needed to do all these things outside of self-defense, right? So there have been revolutionary groups that have done that, the Mau Mau um, in Kenya, right? You have the Black Liberation Army. Um, I mean, we can go on and on about different groups that were like, we have to, you know, we have to do these um, strikes, you know. Heck, the, the ANC, the um, African National Congress of Africa, they actually had a militant wing that felt like, hey, we need to resort to violence to get what we want, right? So, Kilmanga brings that perspective. He brings that idea. Should we be, we be more aggressive, right? And there are people who feel that way. There are people that feel like, yes, you need to be more aggressive. We need to, to, to do that to get our liberation. And I think that's a good discussion to have. I think it's a dope one to have. Um, and then, you know, there are people who automatically say, oh, you got to be like Martin Luther King, et cetera, et cetera. And look, let's have that debate, right? It should, we should have the debate. So again, Killmonger's dope. And those are the different discussions that he brings to the table. Work. Yo, for this health segment, um, I just want to point out a couple of things. I, I know that around this time, um, we know that a lot of people quit on their fitness goals for the new year, um, right, right before March. And I know, I know like, a lot of people are going to say, oh, because people are lazy, they're not really bothered about it. I think what happens is, is that, and I could be wrong, I could be wrong about this. It's the winter blues, man. It's the winter blues, especially like when January comes around, right? Like last week of January, things get warm, right? For like a week or two, and you think like things are going to let up. And then all of a sudden, the temperature just, just drops and you get all this snow. And it kind of like really messes up your groove because what ends up happening is you're forced to stay home for a couple of days. We all are, right? You know, we got to stay home from work or school, et cetera, et cetera. We got to cancel our plans. So what happens is we, you know, I, you know, I hate to use this term, but we backslide. You know, we like forget that we're doing this fitness regimen. So we, we sit out for three or four days, sometimes a week, and then we just don't go back. We might go back once or twice and then we just quit. So it's not really a, you know, a, your week thing. It's not nothing like that. It's just... The weather, man, and I, I get it. I'm, I live in Ohio. Weather sucks here, and um, good reason to move, right? Weather just sucks. So it kind of like really, being that it sucks, it literally sucks your energy. It does. It really makes you really tired of this stuff, and you don't even want to go outside. It makes you want to hibernate. So I guess that's why it happens, and it takes a little bit longer for spring to get here sometimes, uh, because you know you're trying to get everything done it's by spring, which is unrealistic. But when it doesn't work out that way, you kind of feel like you know I'm gonna quit. So my word of encouragement to you is to keep it moving, keep going, push through the pain. I know like, you know, when you, when it's cold, you want to hibernate and you don't want to train. I get it. I do it too sometimes. I don't want to train. But um, I think the best way to do that is to find alternatives. Like here's an example. Like um, if it gets really cold outside, you know, we can't run, right? Really, I, I don't run. So what I do is I use my steps. I might um, go up and down the steps, use, you know, Climbing two steps at a time versus one at a time, maybe three if I could stretch it. Um, also, I use a jump rope. Jump rope is really dope. I don't really have room to put like a mini treadmill in my house. Like, actually, it's not that I don't have the room. I just don't want to get one. So I use a jump rope, and that helps me out a lot. Do calisthenics, um, you know, um, cardio and stuff, just the basic stuff, push up sit-ups, crunches, and stuff like that. You know, if you don't have a jump rope, you can run in place. So there's so many different alternatives that you can use to to substitute it. It's not going to give you like what you need, what you've been getting, but it just keeps you moving, keeps that blood pumping. So I hope that helps out. Word is born. Yo, man, keep rocking. Yo, the big homie who asked not to be named wanted me to talk about 
how, what, you know, should you wear cologne? To wear cologne or not to wear cologne when it comes to approaching women. Um, let me just say this for personal experience. I, I never really wore cologne. When I was younger, I used to buy those oils in the street from the Muslim brothers. I used My favorite was Egyptian musk. I used to rock sandalwood, but for some reason, my body odor just didn't mix with it. So towards the end of the evening, I would smell sour. So Egyptian musk is what I messed with. And I would just put, with my Egyptian musk, I would just put like a little dab on my, my middle finger and then just dab it twice on my neck and that's it. I try to keep it really like light. Um, and the reason why I use oils is because it smelled really carried, um, but it wasn't like overwhelming. And, and that being said, some of us don't know, you know, like, when to lay off of it like some of us will pour it pour it on and and you know you could walk in a room and somebody could smell you as soon as you open the door and another thing i realized is that a lot of people are allergic to a lot of colognes out there it could be like a high quality cologne and it just you know it's just a lot so lately i don't really put anything on um and you know I, you know i wear you know i, I use a beard you know some, a beard cream and i do some coconut oil on my face um, I really don't, you know, I really don't, I know, then again, I use uh, peppermint soap as well, so I smell good generally, despite my bad old body odor, I still, you know, when I come out, when I step out, I smell good, but it's not overwhelming, and people like it, you only really smell it if you're close up to me, so, um, I don't recommend using it, but if you are, go with my Egyptian musk rule, I call it, just dab, you know, just put just a little bit and just dab, if you could put it on your finger and just dab a little bit, and that'll probably help, because some people are allergic to it, for a lot of people, they don't realize that their body might not mix well with that cologne. So, you know, you got to really pay attention, especially like if you like worked all day and then you come out, it might not be really, really smell that smell that well. It might be a little bit tart for some people. So, you know, rule of thumb is, you know, just keep it light, but I don't worry. So I hope that helps out for all of y'all on how to approach women. Word. Y'all know how much I love that that um, Sister Nancy Bam Dub. Y'all know y'all y'all can tell, right? The intro, right? But yo, shout out to a large professor uh, on the main source. Their first album, Breaking Adams, which which is actually a very dope album. And if you've never heard it, you should. Um, essential, essential to Boom Bap. I mean, you really can't, you know, you really, really, really can't talk about Boom Bap rap. But I'm talking about Breaking Adams um, by the main source, like really just can't do that like anyway large professor did a lot of the production on it i mean there's a song on there called just hanging out it's really dope man it's really really dope and shout out to heat rocks because they did an episode heat rocks is a, a podcast started co-founded by oliver wang if you don't know who oliver wang is look him up and in it um they actually had an episode because what they do is they review old albums they'll bring like um celebrities and musicians on there they talk about albums and the last ep episode they bought Farrell Monch and they talked about that and it's really dope and dope anyway it came out back in 1991 on Wild Pitch Records um which had a lot of dope stuff on there and there's a song called Just Hanging Out if you look at the video Nas is in the video a young Nas I think he's like 14 he's in the video for that anyway that album Breaking Adams is actually the first appearance of Nas there's a song called Live at the Barbecue with him Joe just got in Joe Fatal and Akinelli and um it's actually pretty pretty dope um and that's where he was like when i was 12 i went to hell for snuff for jesus and he also said um kidnap the president's wife without a plan that joint that joint was dope so check it out um and it's funny because i almost forgot about it that's one of my favorite songs i'm um, um, just hanging out so but there's a lot of dope joints on there peace is not the word to play and actually a song that i play consistently I, how can i forget these things man? i must be my age i'm about to be 45 so bear with me there's a track on there called Friendly Game of Baseball um, that talks about police brutality. It's a really dope song. And every time somebody's murdered by police, I always play that song, which means I play it often, unfortunately. So definitely go back and check it out. You know, um, you, it's on iTunes. So it's a really dope album. Um, shout out to Large Professor again. I love you, man. Um, but Breaking Adams is the joint. And there's a lot of dope cuts on there. Word. Uh, shout outs. Uh, first up, shout out to my man, my, my brother from another mother, man. I love you, man. 
Billy Wheels, man. I, you know, it's like, y'all love this brother, man. I mean, he literally saved my life. Like, I, that sounds crazy, right? He saved my life, right? Because this is either metaphorically, literally, right? But he did, man. Shout out to you. I love you. I miss your family. Um, his daughter, his oldest daughter, kind of like, she used to she used to play with my kids and really got them to like like school because they used to play school. Like, that was what the game that they used to play. They used to play school. She used to teach. And my kids were like, love going to her class. So that's how they got to love the school was through her. So y'all love you, brother. Word, word is born. Also, shout out to Flint, Michigan. Like, yo, it's been forever, yo. And they still ain't got water, man. Like, yo, that's that's crazy, man. Like, that's really, really crazy. And also, shout out to the family in Puerto Rico, all of them, fam. Um, most of the island is still without power. And it doesn't look like they're going to get it anytime soon. There's some parts that have um, power. But most of the island does not have power. So, yo, shout out to y'all for persevering. You know what I'm saying? And we here, we riding with y'all. Peace. And there you have it, man. I hope I didn't hit you over the head too hard. We out with my killer tape at. If you're going to see us on Twitter or on Instagram, please use the hashtag where my killer tape at. Killer spelled K-I-L-L-A tape at. Word is born. Uh, we are on SoundCloud, iTunes. We are on Stitcher. And we are on Google Play. Um, you can also find me on the Twitters at Dan Trez Omi. Um, D-A-N-T-R-E-S-O-M-I. Also at Omi's podcast. O-M-I-S podcast. Word is born. Y'all take it easy. Be safe. Go out there and see Black Panther. We will see it again. Shout out to all my Kung Fu and Wushu fam in Dayton, Ohio. We will be doing a screening on February 24th at 3.30 um, at the Rave Cinema. So check us out. Word out.